Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Asa Abloy virtual instructor-led training course on a history of codes. What have we learned? What can we do? My name is Katie Flower. I'll be your instructor for this afternoon's session. This session is being recorded and it will be available within 24 hours on the Asa Abloy Academy website. Just click on the virtual instructor-led training and top right-hand corner is a link to all of the recorded sessions. If you happen to miss any that you didn't get a chance to sign up for, it's a great place to recap or review any courses that you've taken or even ones that you missed and weren't able to take. Additionally, there's all kinds of Asa Abloy Academy courses, both online and virtual instructor-led training. And so please keep checking that schedule. It's updated on a two-week uh, cycle and we are adding new courses and new content all the time. Also, if you have any questions, the session will last about 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions. There is a question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. You can type your question in at any point, and we will open it up for questions at the end and ask any of the ones so that everybody can hear what they are and hear what the answer is. Today's class is on the history of codes and how they've changed and what we've learned throughout history. On your screen right now is some of the more influential tragic fires in the United States history that have affected our building codes. I've got some short videos for some of these. We'll review the what went wrong, what happened, what can we do better, how the codes changed, and then uh, towards the end, we'll even hear from an NFPA captain and their take on the whole situation. But the main thing when it comes to doors, frames, and hardware, we're only one part of it. We're, we're a, a large piece of it. Uh, doors and, and hardware are a passive protection from fire and to help with means of egress and getting people out of the building quickly and safely but there's a lot of other parts that go along with it. And that includes sprinkler systems, uh, dead end corridors, travel distance to exits. There's, there's a whole lot, including flammable materials and things that are outside of our control. But the biggest thing in my 35 year career that I've been able to help with is if you see something that doesn't look right on a set of floor plans, bring it to the architect's attention. Or if you're an architect or a contractor, anybody in the built environment can help. It's easier to make changes while it's on paper rather than wait until it's built. If a building is successfully designed and, and built properly with proper number of exits and means of egress components, then it sure makes it a, a safer bet that you're going to be able to get out of that building if there is some kind of incident where you need to. These fires that are listed, the numbers in red are the number of fatalities. These are not in uh, chronological order, they're in order of the number of fatalities. We will be looking at them though in chronological order. And then towards the end, I wanna talk about some of the fires that have happened within the last 50 years. This isn't just ancient history. If you look, there's some in the, in the 2000s, 2003, 2001, 2016. And we have to be ever vigilant because even though we've come a long way in fire safety, we still can't take our, our uh, foot off the pedal and making buildings safe for people who are there on a daily basis. The first one, that I want to talk about is the Iroquois Theater fire in Chicago, Illinois, 1903, December. It had been open for just a, a few weeks and you can see the floor plan. Uh, it's just a large auditorium with a stage and they had a lot of exits. They had some narrow doors, some doors would swing in the wrong direction, but as you watch the video on the next slide, just picture being in an, in an auditorium, it's overcrowded as most assembly occupancies are. Uh, 
uh, the owners trying to get as much money as they can, so they overcrowd the place. You'll hear that they had standing room where they shouldn't have, so they packed all of the aisles with people standing. I'm going to let the video explain uh, a little bit more about this particular fire before we review what went wrong. The deadliest building fire in American history happened right here in Chicago. And there's a pretty good chance that you've never heard of it. This fire is the reason that doors in public places open out. It's the reason there are lighted exit signs and panic bars on emergency exit. It was 1903 at the Iroquois Theater on the spot where the Oriental Theater stands today. More than 600 people died, more than twice as many as in the Great Chicago Fire. Tomorrow morning, a long-forgotten plaque honoring the dead will be rededicated at City Hall. John Calloway told us about the Iroquois Theater fire several years ago. Here's another look at a tragedy that could have been avoided. December 30th, 1903. A hint of snow fell on Chicago as a finely dressed crowd arrived at the Iroquois Theater at Dearborn and Randolph. Marble staircases elegant draperies, over 200 lamps in the main lobby alone. Really uh, incredibly beautiful building. But the Iroquois promised more than just an opulent setting for a show. The architect of the theater, Benjamin Marshall, had said before the theater opened he had studied every theater disaster in history to avoid any problems at the Iroquois, and that in the event of fire, if all 30 exits were used, the place could be emptied within five minutes. Of course, the Great Chicago Fire had just happened uh, a little more than 30 years prior to that and was relatively fresh in people's minds, so uh, the fire safety was, was an important element. But in the fall of 1903, construction of the Iroquois was behind schedule for its November 23rd grand opening. They were under a, a tight uh, gun to get that theater open in time for the 1903 theater season. A lot of corners were cut uh, and uh, inspectors, building inspectors, were paid off with free tickets to uh, make sure that the theater opened on time. The Iroquois 1600 seats were sold out, but more than 2,000 people watched the show. People were packed in. They were standing four deep behind the last rows of seats in the gallery and the balcony. Some people had brought camp chairs and were parked in the aisles. In addition to the overcrowding, some exit doors were bolted shut to keep out gate crashers. And as a precaution to keep people in cheaper seats from gaining access to the more expensive seats during the performance, they put up accordion gates in some of the corridors. So when the fire broke out, it, uh, toward the beginning of Act Two, people were trapped like rats inside this building. By then, the audience knew that the fire was out of control, and they headed for the exits in a panic. But there were no exit signs. The architect found them distracting. Terrified patrons were blocked at every turn. Locked doors, accordion gates, and decorative doors that led nowhere. The Some patrons did find unlocked doors, but many of those were designed to open in, and the crush of the crowd made opening these doors impossible. Even some fire escapes were dead ends. But, but as you can imagine, with the crush of people coming out of the building, it's very difficult for the firefighters to do anything about the fire that's happening inside. So really the fire department's effort is really a, a recovery effort after the fact. The same cloud-heavy system that allowed the Iroquois to open in the first place kept anyone from being held responsible. Even though there was evidence that the building's design was poor and that it lacked adequate safety features, the architect, the owners, and others were found innocent because, as the judge put it, they weren't the ones who placed the light that burned the curtain. You can see more of this video. Uh, the Chicago Fire Department has the full uh, posted online if you wanted to Google and watch the entire video. But back in 1903, even though there were 
some building laws in the city of Chicago, the enforcement was not that high or that great. And it was pretty easy to pay off the fire department or the fire officials to turn their turn and look the other way. I uh, do have a poll question. What type of occupancy was the Iroquois Theater? I'm going to post it and let you go ahead and answer. Is it A, Group B, Business, B, Group A, Assembly, or C, Group H, High Hazard? Ten more seconds and then I'll close polling. And there are the results. 76%, 26 of you say Group A assembly and that is correct. Assembly occupancies are when you gather 50 or more people together for entertainment, eating or drinking, awaiting transportation, and they're among the highest risk when it comes to uh, building fires. You're dealing with large crowds, and a lot of times assembly occupancies will be overcrowded. And a part of being overcrowded is the owner wants to sell seats. They want to sell food. They want to sell tickets. And in this particular case, there were 1,724 seats, and over 2,000 were there that day. The video mentioned that they were standing four deep in the aisles. And that adds to, you know, if everybody's trying to get to an exit, all of the extra people just make things more congested. Other things that went wrong, they had locked and blocked exits. The doors swing in, and this is in 1903. Back then, the exit device hadn't been invented and there was no real good way to latch an outswinging door securely. So most doors in public buildings back then did in fact swing in. So one of the big things that we learned when you have a large crush uh, crowd of people, the people when they panic will push and shove and, and trample each other. And doors that swing in, if you're trying to pull that door open, you're just gonna be pushed against the door and then nobody can open the door. By having a door that swings out, at least you have a fighting chance because you can unlatch the door and then push the door and the crowd can usually push and get out. There were also fake decorative doors to make them look like doors um, and people that could not get out. It confused people. Draperies that covered real doors. No lighted exit signs because the architect didn't like the way that they looked in the dark theater. They, they installed accordion gates, and this was after the fact. There are a lot of things out of our control. Building owners will constantly be wanting to renovate or add things for security purposes. Um, we need to just continue to educate building owners to their responsibility of keeping uh, people safe in a public building. And so the accordion gates that were installed to keep people from getting to the higher price seats, that's part of the owner greed. And sometimes security has to take a, a back seat to life safety. And there are more and more ways as innovation happens where we can accomplish both. But you always have to wear both hats. You have to think about both life safety and security. The fire and the smoke spread rapidly because a lot of times an assembly occupancy is going to have a lot of decorations and those decorations, depending on what the owner uses, can be flammable materials. Even though maybe the building materials aren't flammable, the materials they use to decorate will be. And so when it comes to the built environment, you know, right, on this particular case, nobody went to jail, nobody was fined. There were a lot of violations that people turned their head and, and looked the other way. 
And from a built environment perspective, not anybody said a word during construction when it got rushed. Everybody knew there were violations. They ignored them for the expediency of getting the project done and over with. The codes at the time were minimal and they're very hard to enforce because of the way that they were written. And as noted, nobody went to jail for this and nobody was fined. The next one uh, influential fire in the United States happened in 1911, March 25th, the Triangle Shirtwaist factory in New York City, in the heart of New York City. And as you can see from this picture, there was a bunch of women, mostly women, that were in front of a sewing machine and they had piled up all of these uh, fabrics and materials. You've got back-to-back -back tables of sewing machines and, and people sitting there. Not a big clear egress path in order to get to, here's one exit with the door swinging in, here's another exit with the door swinging in. Two exits should have been enough for the 240 people that were on this floor. It's a large loft on the ninth floor of the Ash Building in downtown New York City. Two exits were enough for the capacity, but number one, they, they swung in the wrong direction. Number two, they were locked at the time of fire because the owner didn't want the girls to take the, they were manufacturing shirtwaist coats. And in 1911, these girls were making, you know, pennies a day. And those coats, they, the owner was afraid that they would take them and hide them and then sell them on the streets for more money than they could make in a day sewing them. And they also were concerned about the union coming in and doing an inspection. So they had the doors locked constantly while the building was in use. And that makes things even more difficult if there is a fire. Let's take a look at this video. Late on the afternoon of Saturday, March 25th, 1911, the 500 employees of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company were racing to fill their quotas. Teenage girls, for the most part, eager to finish up, collect their pay, and plunge into the mild spring evening. Around 4.45 p.m., with just 15 minutes left in the workday, someone on the eighth floor must have dropped a match or burning cigarette into the heaps of discarded fabric that littered the shop floor. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory occupied the top floors of a 10-story building and a fire broke out. Apparently someone had dropped a cigarette into a drawer that held what they called remnants of scraps of cloth and uh, the fire spread pretty quickly. And the doors were locked uh, allegedly to keep out union organizers. This had you know, been a company that resisted unionization was trying to. Uh, so with this rapidly spreading fire, there was really very little way to get out. Uh, and the result was a horrible carnage. Within seconds, the combustible litter of cloth and tissue paper had burst into flames. And before anyone could stop it, the fire began to spread with startling speed from one stack of fabric to another, as cries of panic went out and terrified workers scrambled for the exits. I heard somebody cry fire. I ran for the door on the Washington Place side. But the door was locked and immediately there was a great jam of girls before it. Some girls were screaming. Some were beating the door with their fists. Some were trying to tear it open. Rosie Saffron. It was horrifying. It was a large loft um, in which the doors had been locked from the outside. And so when the fire began, um, the women working at the machines tried to get out of the exits, could not um, move the doors, and uh, there are accounts of bodies being crushed up against the doors, and of women trying to escape. Most workers on the 10th floor managed to escape, held to safety across an adjoining rooftop by students from New York University. Hundreds more made it down by elevator. 30 people at a time, jammed into cars meant to hold half that number. 
But by 4.55, the searing heat had forced the last of the elevators out of service. And with the fire now spreading from the eighth floor to the ninth, nearly 200 women remained trapped in the building with no means of escape. Was felt everywhere that day. But in the weeks that followed, these emotions gave way to angry questioning and a determination that a similar tragedy must never take place in New York again. A few months later, the owners of the Triangle Factory, Isaac Harris and Max Blank, were tried for manslaughter, having locked their workers in. But to the shocked disbelief of the victims' families, and of most New Yorkers, the two men were acquitted when the prosecution was unable to prove that they had actually known that the exit door was locked at the exact time of the fire. There was a trial, and the trial found that the owners were not guilty, for they had broken no law. Yes, they might not have been very nice to have locked in these young women, but there was no law, and so there was no repercussion. There's all kinds of other videos online. Uh, this one was from Mrs. J's History on YouTube. If you want to see the full video. Also, Cornell.edu uh, has a lot of videos as well as a written history of the Triangle Shirtwaist. This fire not only helped change our building codes, but a big reform for factory workers all across the country, not just in New York City, but all across the country. And just to point out again that nobody went to jail, nobody was fined, and the laws at that time, it was just very difficult to get anything to stick. But what went wrong? Again, locked doors, blocked exits, blocked, blocked exit paths because of the way that the tables were back to back and the chairs were in the way and girls climbing over the sewing machines and trying to get to exits and using elevators, which are not part of an, a proper egress path, but you're going to use what you can to get out. And then it, after a while, the elevators were out of service because it was just uh, too hot at that point. And you had doors that swung in instead of swinging in the direction of egress, flammable materials, the, the the coats that these girls were sewing became, they were very flammable materials and helped spread the fire very quickly and the smoke very, very quickly. Delay in notification of the fire. They, they, I don't know if you noticed from the video, but the, uh, the brothers owned the top three floors, the eighth, ninth, and 10th floors. And the ninth floor did not get notification of the fire until it was way too late. And those, that's where most of the fatalities happened. Owner greed. Uh, they locked the doors to keep the girls from stealing coats and selling them on the streets. They also didn't want the union organizers to come in and inspect the factory and, and find any violations. Back then, firefighting ladders could only reach the seventh floor. Nowadays, the maximum for firefighting equipment is it's a hundred foot tall ladder, but it can only reach 75 feet because of the angle that you need to the building. And so a high rise building based on code requirements now is 75 feet or lower below fireman vehicle access is low rise and anything above 75 feet is considered high rise. Uh, the fire escapes that were attached to the building didn't go all the way down to the ground level or under the weight of just a few of the girls trying to get out, the weight of the girls pulled the bolts away from the side. They weren't attached to the side of the building all that well, and they would twist and crumble under the weight of just a few girls trying to use them. So the fire escapes were not in, in good condition or they didn't go all the way down to the ground. It was shortly after this that the building exits code, the very first edition of the building exits code, and the Life Safety Committee was formed. So again, there was a lot of reform for factory workers, but this also brought about the beginnings of the Life Safety Code. The next one is 
1940, the Rhythm Nightclub in Natchez, Mississippi, April 23rd, 1940. Just a real small building. You look at it, it looks, you know, very small, very innocuous. Um, I'll let the video again talk for itself, but being an assembly occupancy, one of the things that is always present is being overcrowded, over capacity. And you'll see why in this short video, uh, this particular case was magnified by something that the owner did. The admission for the dance was 50 cents. And at that time, 1940, a 50 cents was a great deal of money. Everybody in the black community who considered themselves anybody was planning to attend that dance. The owners of the club had decorated the place with uh, flowers and the dangling Spanish moss that often hung from many of the trees throughout the south because the moss was oftentimes found to have small bugs in it, it had been sprayed with flint, which was a petroleum-based insecticide. It was really good for repelling bugs. Unfortunately, it was also very good for inviting a fire. The 50 cents admission, he said, I don't want those people to peep in, so he nailed up the windows. He said, I don't want them trying to break in the back door because we won't be able to see them. So he nailed up the back door. So actually, that was a trap set, not knowingly, but it was because it was only one way in and one way out. Uh, only one way uh, in and one way out of that place. And that wasn't barred, and that was the front door. So anybody that tried to get out of a, a back door or a window or anything didn't have any way to escape anyway. That's the Brian Birch documentary if you want to see the whole thing. Um, again, the, the owner did not want, for the price of 50 cents, did not want people to peep in the windows or sneak in the back door or to let their friends in to get in without a cover charge. So he had them all boarded up and, and shut. And a lot of times, even though a window is not a means of egress, it can be a means of escape for a one-story building if those windows hadn't been barred or boarded up, people could have broken through and escaped through the windows and possibly saved many of, of the lives. Uh, but you've got locked and blocked exits. The only door that was available was the main front door and it swung in the wrong direction. Highly flammable materials, the Spanish moss that was covered with flit in order to keep the bugs off of them. Uh, it was just like he said, liquid petroleum. It was overcrowded. 700 people in that very small building. The fire and smoke spread very rapidly and, and smoke gets so thick and black, it's hard to see. And then people panic and they push and they shove. Um, you've got the owner greed. So again, this is 1940 in the United States and it did lead to uh, code language was still very hard to enforce at this time. The next fire, uh, happened in 1942. And between the two of these fires, it really, they rewrote the building codes to make them much more enforceable. The next one is the Coconut Grove fire in Boston in uh, 19, November 28, 1942. Let's take a look. Um, this floor plan is going to be shown on the video. You'll be able to see the relationship between these, but this is the main revolving door. This is the main entrance to the club. And this set of stairs goes down to the basement to the Melody Lounge where the fire began. You notice that there's no fire door at the top of the stairs. 
So the smoke can just pour up the stairs and across the crowd before they even realize what's going on. This was a new addition and it had recently opened within two weeks of this fire. There was a pair of fire doors that was supposed to go here. They were on order. They had not been installed yet, but the fire marshal allowed this club to open anyway. Uh, so there were no fire doors to stop any of the fire or smoke uh, from coming from downstairs and then completely going across the, the club. There, there were plenty of exits, but a lot of them swung in. Uh, this exit at the top of the stairs did swing out. It did have an exit device, but it also had a double cylinder deadlock and was locked at the time of fire. You may or may not have heard of the video documentary that just came out called Six Lock Doors. It's on Vimeo. It's about an hour and 40 minutes, but it's uh, worth, I don't even remember how much it costs to download, but it's, it's worth it if you wanted to watch the entire history of this fire. We're just going to watch a short snippet of this video. December 5th. 1933. Newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt lives up to his campaign promise and brings prohibition to an end in the United States. In Boston, the city's hottest night spots are celebrating the Latin Quarter, Steubens, the Mayfair. But the hottest of them all is the Coconut Grove. Less than a decade, however, the celebration will come to a tragic end when Boston's most popular nightclub becomes hotter than anyone could ever imagine. A fixture of Boston since 1927, the Coconut Grove has seen quite a few changes since the repeal of Prohibition nine years earlier. Owner Barney Walansky has converted the basement into the Melody Lounge, an intimate, dimly lit piano bar, decorated to look like an island paradise, with artificial paper mache palms and sky blue fabric draped just below the ceiling. Less than two weeks before the football final, Walansky opens the new Broadway Lounge on the main floor of the building next door. Customers enter the main floor of the Coconut Grove through a single revolving door at the club's front entrance, which leads them into the foyer, the caricature bar, and the large dining room. Stairs to the left of the revolving door take patrons downstairs to the Melody Lounge. The new Broadway Lounge has its own entrance off a small vestibule at the east end of the building. A narrow hallway leads from the lounge to the main dining room. Several patrons in the main dining room have already recognized Hollywood cowboy star Buck Jones sitting on the VIP terrace. He's in Boston on the last leg of a cross-country war bond drive. By 10 p.m., staff can hardly maneuver through the crowded dining room. Head waiter Frank Balzarini begins redirecting customers to the new Broadway lounge around the corner. Among them are a young Coast Guardsman named Clifford Johnson and the two football fans, Don Gribbins and Tommy Sheehan. So we met the, the group from Worcester and we tried to get into uh, where they were seated, there was the Norley Lounge, and uh, we could, there was no room there. Designed for 100 customers, there are at least twice that many inside the Melody Lounge. The only access to the basement is the narrow set of stairs to the left of the club foyer. In the corner of the Melody Lounge, Iria Finn celebrates her 21st birthday with friends. We went there about 9.30 and we went into the Melody Lounge and I, we sat directly under the palm tree where it all started. She watches as a young man at the next table loosens the light bulb above him, casting the area in darkness. 
16-year-old busboy Stanley Tomaszewski also notices and alerts one of the bartenders. It is 10 minutes after 10. He uh, was told by the bartender to go over and re-screw in a light bulb that had been uh, unscrewed by a patron who wanted a little, little more privacy for uh, uh, his time with his girlfriend. The light bulb happened to be in one of the coconut husks that was in the, uh, on the palm tree. At first he couldn't find the bulb, so he lit a match and uh, held it up about 10 inches now below the palm tree. Saw the, saw the coconut husk there with a little seven and a half watt light bulb. In. Blew the match out, tightened the bulb, stepped down, put the match on the floor, stepped on it to the left. As the busboy returns to the bar, customers around the palm tree catch a glimpse of orange flame in the paper leaves above. As flames shoot down the wood trunk, staff tries to pull the tree away from the ceiling fabric, but it is too late. Fire explodes across the ceiling with astounding speed, hungrily devouring the decorative cloth. Frantic customers stampede to the only exit they know, the narrow stairs to the main floor. Many try to escape through an emergency exit at the top of the stairs, but the door is bolted shut. Behind them, people push forward, but there is nowhere to go. Upstairs, in the main dining room, customers wait for the floor show to begin. Their attention is drawn to a commotion in the foyer. It sounds like someone shouting, fight! But when a cloud of black smoke pours through the archway, they realize that the word is fire. A blast of flame bolts across the cloth-covered ceiling. Many customers die where they sit, burned by searing flames or smothered by hot smoke. Customers and staff rush to a set of double emergency doors at the back of the club. Just as they discover that the doors are locked shut, the lights go out. And all of a sudden, the place is in pitch darkness. Even if they knew that there was a door somewhere, there was no indication of it. Ravenous for more oxygen, the fire rushes down the corridor leading from the dining room to the new Broadway lounge. So once again, uh, nightclub assembly occupancy with locked and blocked exit doors, doors that swing in, a uh, revolving door is the main exit. And back then the revolving door did not have to collapse and uh, allow egress. The fire and uh, smoke spreading rapidly because of flammable materials. If you think of coconut grove, the palm trees and the, all the different decorations, overcrowded capacity. And again, owner greet, locking doors because they don't want people to slip out the side door and leave without paying their check uh, or let somebody else in, whatever reason. So those two fires, the Coconut Grove and the Rhythm Nightclub, both in the early 1940s, they really set in motion uh, better code language that is more enforceable, but also there, there weren't anywhere near enough people enforcing the codes to begin with. So cities and states hired more people to enforce the building codes, and then they also wrote the, the language so that it would be more enforceable by law in a court of law. Neither building owner ended up going to jail for either one of these. As you know, with the Rhythm Nightclub, the owner died of a heart attack outside of the building. So he never would have been able to go to jail anyway. The next one is 1977, the Beverly Hills Supper Club in Southgate, Kentucky. I'm not going to show a video on this one, but there are plenty of videos out there if you wanted to search and, and watch the history. Part of the problem here is the building had been renovated about seven times over the course of from when it was first constructed. And every time that the building was added onto, nobody rechecked the, the main path of egress. And so a lot of dead end corridors, a lot of blocked exits because there was no clear path, but the majority of the people that died were in the cabaret room. They didn't get notified. There was 
no notification until very late that there was even a fire. They were trying to fight the fire, uh, trying to put it out, trying to make it so that this really ritzy club wouldn't have to be shut down and evacuated, but they waited too long and then the fire and the smoke started rolling down the hallway and some of the doors were swinging in the wrong direction. Others, by the time that you came out into the main hallway, it was already filled with thick black smoke, made it very, very tough. You saw in the video of the uh, Coconut Grove nightclub, how crowded it was and people that are serving drinks, it was very hard for them to get from one table to the next. Just imagine sitting at, in a crowded nightclub and having to exit when all of everything is tight. The tables and chairs are back to back because they want to have as many tables and chairs in there as they can. It's the same thing with this nightclub. They had all kinds of people packed in here, overcrowded, which makes your egress path just to get to the exit very difficult under normal circumstances, let alone under uh, duress, under a fire. So what are the things that we learned in 1977? We had locked and blocked exits. We had doors that still swung in. Flammable materials, overcrowded. Fire and the smoke spread rapidly. Fire and smoke spread rapidly. Some of these fires took a total of 30 minutes for the building to be uh, burned down or before the fire department was able to extinguish it. 30 minutes is a long time uh, compared to the next one that we'll be talking about. But the one in Natchez, Mississippi was less than 15 minutes. It just depends on the size of the building and construction. Uh, but the next one is 2003, the Station Nightclub in West Warwick, Rhode Island. February, this is the one where they had the pyrotechnics. Uh, the band Great White was here. It was after 10 o'clock in the evening, the people in the bar, uh, capacity of 300, there were 462 in attendance that night. And again, why do you have overcrowded in a nightclub? The owner wants to sell food and drinks and uh, tickets to the show. You had a lot of people, by the time that the band was on, they'd already been drinking quite a bit, feeling good, having a good time. There was a sunroom. This was all glass here in the front, but it's a one-story building, so at least they could break uh, the chairs and through the glass to escape through here. There was a back door through the kitchen, staff exit only, but people were led there from staff in order to get out. There was a sidebar here, and they had their own exit door. Some people were able to get out there. You had a pair of doors at the front entrance, but the inactive leaf had surface flush bolts and you've got a bottleneck here with a single three foot door anyway. So even though this is a pair, the maximum capacity would be this single door. You had another exit door from near the stage, but the door that swings out that has an exit device was obscured. The owner put a in-swinging door so that people would not be able to just sneak out this door and at the time of there being some kind of performance so they had the band started and within just a few minutes they lighted fireworks and it's a low ceiling eight foot ceiling the owner had put a acoustic foam on the ceiling to make it sound better this used to be an old storage building and kind of a, a tin building not a lot to the structure itself so to make it sound better they put the acoustic foam the acoustic foam was the wrong type of material highly flammable when the fireworks hit it, it immediately burst into flame. There, there is a video online that you can watch. There was a camera crew there that night that was filming a documentary on nightclub safety. And they were there that night because a couple of weeks earlier in Chicago, there had been not a fire, but at the uh, E2 nightclub in, uh, on the second floor, somebody, had started pushing and shoving and getting into a fight and the bouncers to try to mitigate the fight sprayed pepper spray and the smell of the pepper spray made another guest 
they, they could see some kind of commotion, but they thought it was terrorists. So they started screaming, hey, there's a terrorist in here with a gun. We got to get out. Everybody headed down the stairs towards the exit, but the doors were swinging in the wrong direction and over 50 people were crushed to death just from uh, the force. And that wasn't even a fire. That was just from people uh, pushing and shoving and, and screaming and the smell of the pepper spray. So there was a camera crew here filming a documentary on nightclub safety and they caught the whole thing. If the fire spread so quickly that if you were not out of this building in 90 seconds, you would not have most likely gotten out alive. And most people delayed about 45 seconds before even realizing that the fireworks, that the acoustic foam had caught on fire, they thought it was part of the show. 45 seconds, that's half the amount of time. And so bouncers were trying to keep people from exiting this door anyway, telling them to go around to the front because this was for the band only. And that's not the proper way uh, during a fire. All exits should be open for everybody to use, but they were blocking this and saying, go to the front. Within five minutes, this building was gutted. That's after just five minutes of fire um, just very, very rapid. And it took 10 years. Now, this happened in 2003. And so that's not that long ago. Uh, $176 million lawsuit or settlement after 10 years. A lot of the people, there were 100 people that died that night and another couple hundred that were injured. And when you're injured in a fire, a lot of times you're injured to the point where you can no longer work. And so people, people that were injured from this fire were waiting 10 years to get paid. They ended up going bankrupt because of it. They couldn't work. Um, there were a lot of divorces. There were a lot of split families. The club owners, Jeffrey and Michael Dedarian, offered to settle for 813,000, which was covered by their insurance plan. That was the maximum that they had. Uh, they went, they had bankruptcy protection from lawsuits. The state of Rhode Island paid 10 million as a part of the settlement. I mean, even Anheuser-Busch that sold beer in the establishment, anybody and everybody, Home Depot, uh, the, the uh, radio station that, that was advertising the show, was part of the settlement. So, you know, anybody that works on doors and hardware and, and you think, well, you know, my liability is, is not that high. Nowadays in this litigious society, anybody and anybody that was part of this particular building were, were brought into that, that lawsuit. And 59 million of that 176 went to the lawyers the average per child that was under 18 was about 202,000. And again, this is 10 years after the tragedy. And a lot of these people, by the time they got the money, their whole lives had been destroyed. So, you know, it's certainly not a pretty sight. The owners themselves were three years on probation, no jail time, 500 hours of community service, and their insurance paid the debt, the 813,000 towards the settlement itself. What went wrong? Obviously the locked and blocked exits, things that for a hundred years from 1903 to 2003, some of the same things, you know, we, we know better by now, doors swinging in, flammable materials, overcrowded, fire and smoke spread rapidly, late notification. I mean, it, it just, it still exists today. And there are some buildings that are much better than others. We need the combination of sprinkler systems and fire doors as a combination of active and passive protection in order to not only protect your egress paths, but to keep the building structurally strong enough during that time when you're trying to exit the building. Let's hear from uh, NFPA on this. Sorry. Y yes, I continue to be. I'm still surprised and shocked that it happened almost 10 years ago in the United States. 
you know, when, when the code developers look at these fires, you know, we're out to see, did we miss something? Is there a new lesson to be learned? Is there something else we can do? And just like we saw, even going back to the Coconut Grove fire, the NFPA Building Exits Code knew about the, the, uh, the, the dangerous situation that a revolving door as an exit could cause. The code knew about the use of combustible decorations in these venues. And, you know, the, in, in that case, the city of Boston you know, didn't adopt those provisions. Uh, in the case of the station nightclub, the state did adopt those provisions, but the enforcement wasn't, wasn't where it should have been. Plus, you also had the building owners kind of bypassing the permitting process, the permitting process to, uh, you know, go to your local building department, get a construction permit if you want to make some changes to the building. That building department, that fire department, you know, they're just there for the problem or the emergency. They're there to make sure that you stay in compliance with the code, to make sure that you continue to operate a safe uh, environment. So when building owners bypass those things, it just starts to set up the, you know, it starts to set up the wrong set of circumstances that can lead to tragedy. So again, yes, a lot of these things happen after the building is built and the owner makes changes, but I know that there have been times when I worked as a door hardware distributor and I was asked to come in and take a look at an existing building and provide security for some doors. And I would give them a quote and talk about codes and, and how they can and can't do certain things if, if they want to put delayed egress on uh, assembly occupancy, for example, and I let them know that they can't, they, they want to lock the door on the egress side because uh, they don't want people sneaking out and, and things like that. And I have to remind the building owners and help educate. We're all part of that uh, world in the built environment to educate the building owners as to their responsibilities. A building that is used for the public, for and by the public, has got to meet building codes even after it's built. The owner has a big responsibility. This timeline is just a partial timeline of some of the changes in the building codes and I overlaid it with some of those tragic fires. So we had the Iroquois Theater fire in 1903 and then in 1908 the exit device is invented. Now we have a way to swing the doors out and exit devices, they go at least half the width of the door, the actuating portion that you push in on. They're required for assembly occupancies. They're required for educational occupancies and for high hazard. And they, they were designed in 1908 for outswinging doors. Then we had in 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire with 146 fatalities. In 1913, the Safety of Life Committee is formed. Frances Perkins, who was a big part of the reform from that fire, and she worked uh, for FDR, was a big part of that safety to life committee forming and the changes that, that occurred. In 1927, we had the first edition of the building exits code. The building exits code eventually turned into the life safety code, NFPA 101, the life safety code. In 1934, exit doors, egress doors are required to swing out when there's 50 or more people, regardless of the type of occupancy but especially in assembly occupancies where you've got nightclubs. And so it's mind boggling that in 1940, 1942, 1958, we had the Lady of Angels school fire. All of these facilities had doors that swung in. And a big part of that was we didn't have enough enforcement feet on the street. If you speed, if you're, flying down the highway at 85 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour uh, area, and you see the blue lights come on behind you, you think, ah, oh, crap, I'm going to get fined, I'm in trouble, I'm, I'm breaking the law. But a lot of times, building owners don't realize that they're breaking the law, and they don't get that same feeling. They, they hide from building inspectors, or they know that building inspectors are few and far between back in, in, at this time. And we would have a national tragedy and a big outcry for stiffer building codes and more enforcement. 
And then things would kind of simmer down after time goes by. People kind of forget and become complacent. And so that's why we keep seeing these pockets of tragedies and change. Then more time goes by, then more tragedy, and then more change. So in 1966, exit devices are required in places of assembly and educational with 100 or more occupant load. And then that later gets changed in uh, when the IBC begins in the year 2000, it gets changed to 50 or more people. The Beverly Hills Supper Club in 1977. And then in 1981, this really has nothing to do with uh, a tragic fire, but delayed egress devices are allowed for the first time in 1981. In the year 2000, when the IBC is formed, positive pressure fire testing is now required in the United States. So swinging fire doors need to be tested under positive pressure. Then we had the World Trade Center fire and 2,752 fatalities in 2001. That's not a fire that we would expect, flying planes in a building, but we're in a new world now and we've got to look at threats from a lot of different situations. And so while the number of fatalities was high, it's because it was a very 110 story building with over 10,000 people. The good news is that on that day, 95 to 99% of the people that were below the level of where those planes were impacted were able to safely exit the buildings and get away. Uh, most of those fatalities came as they were above where the planes hit. The Station Nightclub fire in Warwick, Rhode Island in 2003, those, both of those tragic fires helped bring on a few of these next changes. In 2006, low level exit signs and exit path lighting in uh, stair towers. So when you have a high rise building, you now need to have illumination for your exits, the low level illumination. Smoke rises and quickly obscures that exit sign above a door. But when you have the low level exit signs and egress path lighting, it really helps make sure to uh, guide people to the exits. In 2006, annual inspection of fire doors became a part of NFPA 80 requirements. And in 2006, the main entrance in assembly occupancies, over 300 people need to accommodate half the occupant load. The tendency when we have places of assembly, people remember the way they came in and that's the way they try to exit. That's the only exit they're familiar with. And so rather than accommodate uh, before, if you had three different exits, they were divided into one third, one third, and one third, equally distributed. In 2006, the main entry for that assembly occupancy that has more than 300 people has to accommodate half. So that means wider exit doors or multiple pairs of doors at the main entry to accommodate a heavier load, just knowing that's human nature. And also in 2006, the exit device requirements changed to 50 or more people in uh, IBC. NFPA 101 still has the requirement of 100 or more people, but when you have two codes that conflict, the more restrictive one is the one that you have to follow. And in 2009, the annual inspection of egress doors is also, so fire and egress doors need to be annually inspected. And so the more feet on the street that we have looking at fire doors and egress doors and making sure that they comply, the better we're able to help keep the built environment safe. And a lot of the fires that we talked about are older, but here is a list of the deadliest building fires in the United States just in the last 50 years. And nowadays we do have people trying to blow up buildings like the federal building in Oklahoma City, the World Trade Center, uh, truck bombs or planes flying into buildings. There's any number of different things that can cause a fire in a building nowadays. And, and the codes are written around ordinary hazard and then they're elevated for higher risk and you get exceptions for lower risk. Uh, but just because there hasn't been a fire in a, in a little bit doesn't mean that what we are doing as a, as a industry isn't working, it is working.
but we can't get complacent. And one of the things that I've seen change in the last several years, and it's as a reaction to the school shootings, which is a security issue, and it is a big issue in the United States, but barricading a classroom door so that people can't get out is not the answer. We are working, trying to change the codes so that states realize that okay, there hasn't been a fire, a tragic fire in a while, but that doesn't mean that we want to invite that. By barricading a door and stopping means of egress, that's not the solution. There are solutions that provide free egress and still give you uh, both life safety and security. And that's my, my last point is, in the door hardware industry, we have to walk that line that between life safety and security. The building owner is pushing for security. We have to help educate them as to the life safety aspect and their responsibilities. We wanna give them both and there are ways to give them both. We're always looking for innovation and ways to make things reasonably priced so that building owners don't balk. But at the end of the day, if you have to put your fist on the table and say, look, you know, what is your son or daughter's life worth? Is it worth that amount? We really need to be able to have both life safety and security and education is the key. What I call it is safe security so that you can have that blended balance of both. And one thing that Francis Perkins said is those that cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So thank you all for being here today to learn a little bit more about the history of codes, how it's affected our doors and hardware, and some of the reasons why we have certain things. We can't be complacent. We've got to continue to always strive towards educating owners and architects and anybody in the built environment. If you see something, say something, much easier to change it while it's still on paper. And now if there's any questions, I'd like to open it up to questions at this time. Okay, hey, at this point, there are no questions. Okay, we can wait for just a couple of minutes, but thank you everybody for joining. Uh, there are all kinds of code classes on Asablo Academy, as well as the ones on the virtual instructor led training. If you need to brush up on any aspect of the codes, we cover all the different subjects. There's also other product specific courses that Asabloy uh, has. I welcome you to check out Asabloy Academy virtual instructor led training. The courses there are on a two week cycle, but we're always adding content. Any questions right now or are we still good? Um, hold on one second. Okay. A pretty simple question for you. A fire, a fire rated door and frame should always have labels on both. That's correct. The, the frame does not have an hourly rating. It takes on the rating of the door. The door will have the 90 minute, 60 minute, 20 minute, whatever the actual rating is. The fire door assembly is going to be based on the door, but the frame and the hardware need to all be uh, present in order to make that rating possible. No more questions at this point, just a bunch of comments saying how wonderful and how enjoyable it was. Great, and it will be up on the recording by tomorrow. You'll also get a thank you email, which you can use for continuing edu uh, education credits if you need to. And so I hope you all have a wonderful day and see you again at another Asabloy Academy webinar shortly, soon.